Well, thanks everyone for listening today. My guest is Nick Chansey. So Nick, do you want to just start out by just introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about yourself and your family? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Nick Chansey and uh, I am the uh, Catholic Campus Minister and Newman Center Director at Marshall University, which is in Huntington, West Virginia. And uh, I have lived in West Virginia my entire life. I actually uh, became Catholic uh, here at this very Newman Center, believe it or not. Um, I grew up agnostic. Uh, and I currently uh, serve uh, the university uh, with my wife. Uh, and we have a five-month-old uh, daughter. And we're very blessed to get to live actually above uh, the center so we can kind of share our family uh, with the students um, and kind of be witnesses uh, to them. That's so cool. And congratulations on your daughter. That's that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned you grew up agnostic. So what what's your faith background? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up in uh, rural West Virginia, which is sort of Bible Belt territory. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of Baptists, a lot of fundamentalist Christians. And, you know, growing up in an agnostic household, my parents were very spiritual people. Uh, so, you know, they would talk about everything from uh, Buddhist stuff to Native American things, you know, just this kind of conglomeration of, of uh, uh, you know, competing sort of ideologies. Um, and so it was pretty common for me growing up to hear from, you know, uh, another student or maybe a, a Baptist preacher that would come knocking on our door uh, to basically tell us, you know, that you're going to go to hell uh, because you're not saved. <laughs> uh, or to get that question, you know, are you saved? Um, and so that my my understanding of Christianity was very shallow growing up, actually. Um, also, you know, a lot of people I knew, their understanding of science included uh, images of Jesus on a dinosaur which, you know, I was like, okay, well, that sounds wackadoodle to me. So, you know, I thought all Christians believed that, and I thought they were very anti-science. And so uh, I, I didn't really think much about God until, um, like, the end of high school or college when I started asking those deeper questions. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Marshall, um, and I took a philosophy class. And we were learning about Plato's Republic. And I, I just found philosophy fascinating. And at one point in the Republic, um, you know, Socrates is talking about um, the fact that there is uh, this fiery place where people go, which is hell. And so to hear this, like, pre-Christian philosopher uh, talking in a really intellectual way about um, a hell place fascinated me because I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe this isn't just a, an entirely man-made understanding. And so that's where I got the, the gears turning in my head. And that happened right as I uh, got invited to the Marshall Catholic Newman Center uh, for their midnight pancake breakfast <laughs> by a friend who was Catholic. And I, I didn't want to go. I was, <laughs> I was really skeptical because my experience with Christians had been so negative growing up. I was like, oh, gosh, you know, are these people going to ask me if I've been saved? Are they going <laughs> to beat me over the Bible? You know, I didn't know. And so, but I, I trusted my friend, and I went to that pancake breakfast. And, you know, it was a really fun laid-back event. They taught me how to make pancakes. They just got to know me. We joked around. It was really lighthearted. And so I ended up going back to that Newman Center every week for their weekly uh, dinner for a dollar meals. And I did that for like two years in college and all the while not realizing that I was very gradually becoming a part of that community hmm. of those people. And, you know, I'm becoming friends with them. And I remember one day at, after going there for a while, uh, seeing my picture on the wall with all the other <laughs> pictures. And I was like, what's my picture doing here? You know, like, I'm not Catholic. And they're like, yeah, but you're, you know, you're a part of the Newman Center. You're one of us. And so I think it was the end of my junior year. I'm just, you know, eating dinner there as, as I did. And really, I can only say that it was grace that I all of a sudden realized that all of these people 
who are funny and intelligent and dynamic and compassionate, they all believe in Jesus Christ and they're all Catholic. Hmm. And so I respect them so much that maybe it's something that's worth my time looking into. And so that led uh, into a, an entire summer, really, where I kind of dove head first into Catholicism. And again, Providence, uh, I had a Protestant friend who was really, really good friends with a Polish Catholic family in rural Ohio, which is just right across the river from us in West Virginia. And so uh, she took me there to meet them and they were wonderful people. And they answered all of my questions and they lent me uh, the Catholicism series by Robert Barron. And I took that home and I watched it and I was just totally enthralled because I had a sort of a laundry list of things I didn't understand about Catholicism. You know, like, what is the Pope, right? Um, what's the deal with saints? And and how does Mary, you know, fit into all of that? And, you know, so I, I, I had this, this list of things that I wasn't sure about. And as I watched this 10-part series, every single thing was sort of getting checked off the box because it was very methodically explained to me and most importantly, um, Jesus Christ was also explained to me in a way that I had never heard before. Uh, now, Bishop Barron, he described Jesus as being this very mysterious figure who amazed uh, and even to some extent scared the apostles because he was so uh, beyond their understanding. And that just fascinated the heck out of me. And so I wanted to know more about Jesus. Who is Jesus? And so over the course of that summer, I, you know, just dove into the Word on Fire catalog because they have all these podcasts and YouTube videos. And, um, and I really learned a lot. And so when I got back in the fall uh, and found my world sort of turned upside down, you know, I'm praying now for the first time and living my life in a different way, um, I told the Newman Center director that I wanted to uh, join the RCIA program. And so uh, I did, and it was great, and I learned even more. And, you know, here I am. Now I'm like the Catholic nerd of uh, the Newman Center. I'm talking about Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine. And at one point, I think the, the campus minister, she made the joke. She said, I think you know more about theology than most of the Catholics that come here, which is just funny. Um, so I, I ended up uh, be, being baptized and confirmed into the church on April 19th, 2014. And I came back the next year and I was a Newman Center leader uh, and I helped and uh, I graduated that year. And then uh, having my life just be totally, totally changed and wanting to really devote myself to God um, and discern where he was calling me, um, I took a year uh, to after I graduated from college uh, to be a missionary intern uh, for the uh, youth office of our diocese. And so for a year, I lived in the mountains of West Virginia at this beautiful uh, a Catholic pastoral center slash camp. And so I did everything from run summer camps to, uh, you know, uh, develop youth rallies, um, you know, faith sharing, uh, the, the, the whole gambit. And the whole while I was also discerning my vocation. And as that year progressed, you know, I really found that one, I believed God was calling me to a life of marriage. And two, that I wanted to be able to give to college students what was so graciously given to me. And so I came out of that missionary experience, um, not only with the formation of ministry, but also with a deep desire to want to do campus ministry myself. And so uh, by God's wonderful providence, it just so happened that the uh, campus ministry position in Charleston, West Virginia, at University of Charleston opened up. And so I applied and uh, I got it and I uh, ministered there for three years. And then my old campus minister at Marshall, she finally moved on. And uh, that's when they moved me here. And I've been here since uh, 20, 
19. And so in that time, uh, I uh, married my amazing wife, Mary Claire, and uh, we uh, had our baby, uh, little baby Margaret, uh, five months ago. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a pretty active time, to say the least. Yeah, that's crazy. So in the span of a few years, you went from being a college student at a Newman Center, just hanging out, eating free food as college students, of course, love. And then um, you said, was it your senior year that you joined RCA and then became Catholic? Yeah. So I, uh, I, as many college students do, and it's kind of becoming the norm now, I switched majors like halfway through. And so I did what they called the, the victory lap, which was my fifth year. So oh, okay. it was my, huh, I jokingly say it was my first senior year uh, that I uh, went through our CIA and became Catholic. And then uh, my fifth year here, I was a, a leader with the ministry. Okay, got it. So um, you shared that there were some kind of some things on the list that you were maybe not sure of. Do you want to share any of those that were maybe um, roadblocks or areas where, they, did you have any like aha moments? I'd love to just kind of hear um like that yeah. side of things. I I had a just a series of uh, what I would call mind blowing moments where I would hear something or I would learn something, and it just uh, made my brain explode because it it was just so incredibly true, and again sort of life changing when you think about it. Yeah, uh, one of those was learning about Jesus in regards to his crucifixion. And this was in one of the episodes of the Catholicism series. And Bishop Barron basically takes the viewers um, to Germany uh, to look at the Eisenheim altarpiece, which is this incredibly beautiful and very like unromanticized, uh, scary image of the crucifixion, right? I mean, there's Jesus hanging on the cross and you can see his wounds and his mouth is agape and, you know, there's his mother and she's very sorrowful. And, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't a cleaned up version. And Jesus, uh, Bishop Barron uses this image of Jesus um, to explain uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's uh, understanding of what it means to be a happy man. And, you know, Jesus calls all of us to a life in him and, to find joy in that. And so Bishop Barron explains that, you know, we need, it's, it's our calling to love what Christ loved on the cross and then, uh, you know, hate what Christ hated, right? Well, what was he against? Well, he was against uh, the things of this world, pleasure, power, honor. Uh, so is there any pleasure in being crucified? Absolutely not, right? He's being tortured. He's being brought to the limits of uh, human uh, living, right? He's, he's on the verge of death. Okay, does he have any power? None, right? He is, he's on the cross. He is, he's sort of trapped there, and he is, he's powerless, right? Um, you know, we talk about pride, right? Is that is, or honor, and, you know, from the Roman perspective, absolutely not. There's no honor in that, right? He's, he's being literally executed on the cross. So uh, he, he has no money, no wealth. Uh, he's, you know, he, does, he doesn't even have any more uh, the clothes he was wearing. They stripped him of that. And so when we look at the things of this world that we're so always so tempted to revolve our lives around and to sort of idolize, Christ has none of that hmm. uh, being crucified. And so Bishop Barron makes the point that, it, you know, as Aquinas says, it's for us to emulate Jesus, and we'll find ultimate joy in that. And so in a really roundabout, very paradoxical way, the man that you see here on this cross being crucified is actually a happy man. And that was the moment that I realized, and I... I did then, and years later, I continue to sort of just reflect on that. I realized that I had to turn my life totally upside down to what I'd been doing. Uh, you know, our natural inclination as human beings, really, is to serve ourselves. That's, that's what we want to do. We want to be comfortable, and uh, we want to be happy all the time. Uh, we want to do what feels good. And we live in a culture and a society 
that really underscores that. It fans, it fans the flames of that, really. And so to hear then that I really would never find ultimate joy in that, which I hadn't, that changed my world. And that changed my life in a really big and dramatic way. And so today, even, uh, when I have my five-month-old and she's screaming and crying at 2 a.m., I think of the Eisenheim altarpiece and I think of Aquinas' teaching on that, you know, like, this is my calling, right? This is literally what God's put me on this earth to do, is to love this little screaming human that cannot love me back. Um, and that was and that was another mind-blowing moment when uh, Bishop Barron talked about the, the meaning of love and what is love. And myself, like countless others, understood love to be this finite emotion, right? The ooey gooey feeling you feel uh, when uh, you're attracted to someone and, you know, when you uh, just fall for somebody, you know, you fall head over heels for them. You know, there's millions of songs about it. And so that was what I thought love was. But really, uh, love, is, according to Aquinas, is to will the good of another, expecting nothing in return, Right. It is this selfless, sac selfless, sacrificial giving of oneself uh, for the good of others, expecting nothing in return, right? And that the ultimate example of that is Jesus on the cross. And so I have to now live my life in selfless love for others. And, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't grow up hearing this, so... Being a 20-something-year-old uh, who started college because I wanted to get rich and make lots of money and be happy, um, now having to rethink my entire worldview, my entire way of living, my daily habits, all of these things, uh, that rocked my world in a really big way. And so I, I try my darndest uh, every day to live that, and my hope is that as a campus minister, I can be an example of that to these students, right? And so when I, I'm never I'm never complaining, I'm just being honest with them when they're like, oh, you look tired. I was like, oh, well, you know, I was up until three in the morning uh, with my baby. And, but I want them to see that because I want them to see uh, me trying my best, right? To live out that sacrificial calling that God calls all of us to. Um, so yeah, the understanding of love and that understanding that, um, Jesus on the cross is the ultimate example of love. Uh, that was definitely one of the biggest mind blowing moments I had in my conversion. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's, yeah, that's just so beautiful to see that, you know, you went from someone that was not really familiar with Christianity to just being so, um, so influenced and just really dived into what, what Jesus, what his life and what his death meant. That's really amazing. So you're married now. How, how, how do you feel, um, you know, being someone who maybe didn't grow up in the church and now raising your family, um, you know, discerning marriage, how does, how does that work? You know, being, being maybe still, you know, somewhat, somewhat new. I mean, you know, you're seven years in, but I don't know if you could just share a little bit about what it means to be yeah. like, um, Catholic and, married yeah you know it's it's definite the vocation of marriage and the sacrament of marriage is definitely what marriage is and i say that because a lot of people ha have a lot of misconceptions about marriage i think they have a lot of false ideas about what marriage is supposed to be and we live in a culture a throwaway culture really that says, oh, well, you know, if you're not happy, then yeah, give up. You know what? Just, just sign the papers and, 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 and move on, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that, and we also live in this world, right, that has this deep misunderstanding about love. And so people oftentimes do get married because they have those intense feelings, which are good, right? You should have those intense feelings for the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. But the foundation of that covenant cannot be those feelings. It has to be Christ. It has to be God. And so that's 
one of the, I mean, I could give you an infinite list as to why I love being Catholic, but that would be definitely at the towards the top is the church really does teach the truth of what the sacrament of marriage is. And that just so to discern that we have to take that really seriously. And I'm not going to sit here and say that, oh, yep, uh, the, the, the light bulb went off and then I was a perfect Catholic and I figured it all out overnight. No, definitely not. Uh, in fact, I'm still figuring it out because uh, fun fact, we're all sinners and, you know, we're trying, right? And conversion is not something that happens overnight. It's it's a lifelong calling. So for me, discerning that, it, it took several years. Um, I felt pretty confident coming out of, that missionary year that I wasn't called to the priesthood. And I, I spent a lot of time um, praying and thinking about myself as a priest. You know, could I imagine myself celebrating the sacraments? Could I imagine myself um, basically, you know, marrying the church, making the church my bride and serving her in that way? And for me, and again, this will be different for everybody because we all, God speaks to all of us uniquely and we're all unique people with our own unique gifts and talents. So, you know, uh, it's not a copy and paste for anyone, but for me personally, it never felt natural to imagine myself in the role as a priest. But when I thought about marriage and becoming a father, that seemed much more natural to me. And it took years for me to be able to really figure that out. And I would go so far as to say that I was truly not ready <laughs> to seriously discern that calling until uh, a few years ago when I completed the Exodus 90 program. And if you're not familiar with Exodus 90, it's an incredible <clears throat> excuse me, incredible faith formation program, which basically um, requires one to give up the distractions of the world, right? Giving up uh, video, that's like all, all, everything, streaming, video games, whatever, uh, you know, that it requires you to, to fast a lot, to not snack, uh, to exercise, uh, to take cold showers, that sort of thing. It's, it's the aesthetic life. And in getting rid of a lot of these worldly distractions, you can really center your life back to Christ and really be able to listen to him. And so I started Exodus 90, and it's this 90-day journey that starts in January, goes to Easter. And I knew I couldn't watch any TV or anything. And so I decided I would read The Lord of the Rings because... Uh, I had watched the movies for years, and I love the story, and I've always wanted to read the book. And so, uh, I and I had this like really thick volume of it. So, I just started my own journey uh, through Middle Earth, reading The Lord of the Rings. And I, by the time we got to Easter, I had just about finished The Fellowship of the Ring. And as soon as soon as Exodus ninety was over, and I'd had and I had this beautiful mental and spiritual clarity that I didn't have before, um, I got back on uh, this Catholic dating site and I decided that I would expand my search radius to hundreds of miles because at that point I knew definitively that I was called to the sacrament of marriage. And if priests take this, their sacrament um, as seriously as to go to seminary for years on end, then I need to be serious about my calling to marriage and be willing uh, to uh, date someone, even though they wouldn't be anywhere near me. And so I did that. And um, the next day, uh, I see uh, this very cute girl, uh, her profile, and I click on it. And she's all the way in Virginia. But the first thing it said was she was a huge Lord of the Rings fan of the books. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, finally, somebody I can talk about the books with. Because none of my friends had read them. They'd all watched the movies, but none of them had read the books. And and during this my this spiritual journey I had, that the, you know, those books spoke to me in a really personal, spiritual way. And so I messaged her and, with a sincere desire to just want to talk about the Lord of the Rings books. And we just instantly uh, hit it off. 
with incredible conversation. And within a week or so, uh, we exchanged phone numbers and we ended up talking over the phone uh, for sometimes hours on end in the evening, every evening. And though we weren't close to each other, the distance really forced us to get to know each other really quickly because all we had were those phone conversations. And so eventually uh, we agreed uh, to sort of uh, meet somewhat in the middle uh, for our first date. And uh, it was uh, one of the most beautiful, captivating experiences I think I'd ever had. And really, I knew in my mind that this would be the, the woman I'd marry. And so uh, it was pretty, it was pretty beautiful. I'll save, I'll save our first date story for another time, but uh, we, we discerned together. And um, after, uh, after several months, uh, we, we had discussed briefly the possibility of marriage. And uh, uh, I ended up uh, over Thanksgiving break, uh, we ended up going to uh, St. Louis. And there is the Basilica of St. Louis, which if you've never been, it is, in my opinion, the most beautiful Catholic church in the United States. Mm -hmm. It is just incredible. It's There's gold mosaic that covers all of the ceiling. There's this massive dome. It, look it up, Google St. Louis Basilica it, when you're done watching this because it's just incredibly beautiful. And, um, and so I took her there and that was where I proposed. And uh, she said, yes, thank God. And uh, then we made these incredible uh, plans for our wedding. We were going to get married in that following June and we're going to have this big reception and our families would be there. And, uh, we got to, uh, March and that's when COVID-19 happened. And we, as things were closing down, I mean, the, everything was shutting down. We knew that we didn't want, we didn't know what was going to happen and that we didn't want to spend a, an unknown amount of time being that far apart from each other. And so uh, she, uh, as a uh, librarian and teacher, when her school was made virtual, uh, she packed up and came here. And my incredibly amazing priest allowed her to stay in the apartment that the parish owns. Uh, and we just sort of let it, it sink in over time that we weren't gonna get to have the wedding that we planned mm. and we weren't gonna get to, have the reception that we had planned. And so then the question was, do we wait an undetermined amount of time to get married? Or for us in our situation, knowing without a shadow of a doubt, having prayed and discerned this so seriously that we're called to marriage and we're really, God's calling us to marry each other, um, do we just go ahead and get married? And so that was, an incredibly difficult decision and uh we didn't make it lightly and so we spoke to our priest and uh he uh, he agreed with us and so we ended up having a very 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 small uh wedding ceremony uh, with all of six people um two of her sisters and the photographer included and we streamed it on facebook i think several hundred people watched it so more people actually got uh, uh to, to watch the wedding than they would have otherwise um and yeah and then we, we got married in april at the height of uh, lockdowns and everything so uh it's been a whirlwind and it's been in its own uh incredible adventure we we keep talking that we'll write a memoir about this at some point probably when we're no longer li still living in it <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a story for the books. There's no doubt about it. Gotcha. You mentioned so that, you know, like marriage, the sacrament of marriage is one of the things that you love about being Catholic. Could you, could you go through some of the other things on that list of, of things that you love about being Catholic? Oh gosh. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> where do I, where do I begin? Well, first off, I'll say this. One of my favorite quotes, mm -hmm. it's by GK Chesterton. And he said, treat your religion less like a philosophy and more like a love affair, right? Mm -hmm. And so I love that because at the heart of Christianity is a person and it's Jesus Christ. And he calls us, each of us, um, to know him uh, and to love him. And so when it comes to the things that I, that I love about Catholicism, I love those things. And I'm really passionate 
about those things. And that's one of the many reasons I love being a campus minister is I get to just share that uh, wantonly with uh, these students and in, in, in the world. And um, so, you know, just off the top of my head, uh, one of the things I absolutely love is the Blessed Sacrament, uh, the Eucharist, being able to share in the body and blood and soul and divinity of our Lord uh, at Mass in the liturgy is mind-blowing, and it never fails to be mind-blowing. Uh, I'm a human, and so, you know, uh, and I have a baby, and so, you know, at Mass and things, I, I can get distracted and, and not always appreciate that as much as I should, but... Um, I get really, really passionate about it as a topic. And being in West Virginia, uh, which is a predominantly Protestant place, I think mm -hmm. only three or 4% of the people here are, are actu actually identify as being Catholic. Um, you know, that's something that I talk about a lot, especially because we'll have Protestants that join us for mass and I'll have to discuss with them that, you know, when it comes to uh, communion, um, you know, you'll you'll need if you if you want a blessing, you'll have to you know cross your hands. Otherwise, you would have to be uh, Catholic. But I to receive absolutely the Eucharist. Love... That is, yeah, the Eucharist. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, uh, the Eucharist. And so, you know, when I heard John Bishop Barron discuss John six and uh, the bread of life discourse, in which Jesus is talking about, um, you know, how this is my body. And, and what he meant by that. And when, when you actually look at the Greek understanding of that. Um, and, I, and I remember one time as a student, I did go to a, uh, a ecumenical Christian uh, function on campus. And uh, it was a really fun time. Lots of different denominations participated. And so I, I, I went up to the guy that organized it. And I said, you know, thank you for doing this. I, I said, I feel so welcome. I'm becoming Catholic. And as soon as I said that, his eyes get like this big. He's like, oh, really? Well, hey, I just I just have a question uh, for you. Uh, and, you know, oh, I think it was something like, uh, you know, you uh, don't you all think you uh, you get the whole uh, bread of life thing a little too literally? Like, don't you think it's kind of like cannibalism? And I was like, wow, OK, just just gut punch. And uh, but again, I was like knee deep in learning about the faith. So. I had a theological rebuttal for him, and uh, he didn't expect that. And then a, another person came up, and they uh, they said something to the tune of, um, you know, why do you, why do you have, feel like you have to work for your salvation? Mm -hmm. Wasn't it enough that Jesus died on the cross? And and oh, and so I talked about love, and uh, God calls us to a life of love, and what is that? Can and you so, can you share more about that? Because I think that um, yeah, that's so common, um, you know. Yeah, and that's actually, that's a big part of what I do, too, with our students is I try to sort of give them a basic understanding of these things because so many Pro Protestants will ask questions like that. And so, yeah, so when, when he asked me, you know, why, why are we a works-based faith? I said, we're not a works-based faith. We are a, a God-based faith. We're a Christ-based faith. And if I know that God is love, well, no... No Christian is going to deny that, right? Okay, God is love. Well, if God is love and God calls us to love one another, right? That was like one of the main commandments, right? Uh, uh, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul um, and love others as you love yourself. Okay, so I'm, that's, that I'm, I have to do that, right? I'm called to do that. Well, then, of course, I'm going to care for others. Of course, I'm going to care for the poor. Of course, I'm going to... Um, you know, tr serve the community. That that has to be a part of my faith because if it's not, well, then how am I any better than the Pharisees who uh, would uh, go to the corner and, uh, you know, preach loudly how faithful they were, right? Um, and those were the people that Jesus uh, came down on the hardest through the Gospels are, are, are the Pharisees. So, are you telling so, yeah, me that that's... the Pharisees and the Catholics are not the same? They're different. <laughs> I know. Well, and and you know what? There there are there are Protestants who'll be like, well, I think I think you're a little Pharisaical, 
And on a shallow level, I can see where they're coming from because, like, well, you know, the Pharisees, they were obsessed with ritual and they had forgotten about uh, really the Lord and their purpose. And, and they see us and they see our ritual. And, and, but, but that's, not, that's not true at its core. Um, we're not the same at all uh we we don't worship uh the sacramentals right um all, the, the 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 sacraments are all meant to draw us closer to god literally i mean when the the, the priest when he's hearing confession when he is consecrating the bread of the wine he is acting in persona christi right he is in the person of christ so we uh through the sacraments are having this incredibly beautiful, mysterious encounter with God personally. Um, and so if you're coming from a faith background that is totally devoid of the sacraments, then that's going to be something that is very foreign to you, um, that it would take you time to learn and understand and try to wrap your head around. Yeah, that's so good. Um, so you mentioned you obviously work with um, with students as part of a as being a Catholic minister. Um, what what have you um, what would you share with someone that is maybe um, interested in becoming Catholic? What advice or what encouragements would you give them? Yeah, you know, um, I would. So for me, as someone who works in ministry, um, that's somebody that I really want to get to know and I want to get to know them on a personal level. So um, what kind of person are they? What, what speaks to them? You know, for me, uh, theology really spoke to me. Um, I didn't realize that Christianity was so intelligent <laughs> uh, to be blunt. And so, you know, but that doesn't speak to everybody, right? Um, we, we, we know that there are the transcendentals, the true, the good, and the beautiful. These are the things that are transcended directly from God. And so is this someone who will, uh, you know, be more sparked by the true? Or is it somebody that will be more sparked by the good or the beautiful? And so, you know, if there's somebody that really loves the architecture of the church and really loves the incense, really loves the stained glass windows and, and all of that, um, you know, I'm going to make it a point to... Uh, either take them to the local parish and show them uh, the beauty of the church or take a group uh, to the cathedral so they can really see the beauty of the church on full display. Um, you know, if it's somebody uh, that is really into the truth, then I am going to share with them uh, some of those resources that were shared with me, right? Um, Word on Fire is such an incredible basis uh, for that. It's literally the intro to Catholicism. Um, there's a, you know, there's Father Mike Schmitz in the Bible in a Year podcast and, uh, you know, there's Ascension Press and uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole host of, of things, but ultimately for me, I'm getting to know them and I am befriending them. Um, it, we call it relational ministry and, and I'll, and to say briefly, and hopefully some other lay ministers will hear this too, um, there's a temptation in ministry to befriend the people we're ministering to as a means to an end. So I'm going to make friends with them and I'm going to, I'm going to try to make them Catholic. And if uh, they don't want to become Catholic or right, I'm just going to move on to the next person. Uh, but these are not objects. These are, these are human beings. These are children of God who have human dignity, who need your friendship because God's loving them through you, right? Through me. And so uh, I'm going to continue to try to be their friend. Uh, regardless of their interest in the faith, because by golly, if they don't know any other Catholics, well, they sure know me, and I'm going to be the light of Christ in their lives, um, or try as hard as I can to do that. So, you know, uh, one resource I was kind of hoping you might ask me this question, uh, that I, I talk about this a lot. I promise they don't pay me, okay? Uh, but I very much recommend the Word on Fire Bible, um, this is the first volume. It's going to be multiple volumes, but this is just the Gospels. Uh, but what makes this such an incredible Bible is that uh, it doesn't just have uh, beautiful artwork, which, again, talk about the trans transcendentals. Uh, so it's got the beauty on full display here. I mean, just, I mean, look at that. But it also has all of these incredible, 
incredible resources. So when you're reading the Gospels, inside this are um, uh, reflections on each of those passages from Bishop Barron, from uh, church fathers, from theologians, uh, from all of these people to give you a, a deeper understanding and perspective so that you can actually really fully appreciate what it is that you're reading. I have, and, I, and I'll be honest about this, and this is probably very Catholic of me, um, I've, I've, I in the past have not been really excited to read the Bible. I've, I've enjoyed reading it. I do it as a, as a spiritual and academic uh, thing, but owning that version of the Bible actually excites me because I can understand it and appreciate it on an even deeper level. And that only goes even further to sort of nourish uh, me spiritually. So uh, there's a whole host of uh, resources and things that I'd recommend, but that's probably at the top of my list right now. So just a last question for you. Is there anything else that um, you would just want to share about your faith with others before we wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I would say um, if you are Catholic and you're watching this, um, one, check out We're on Fire. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. But also think of the non-Catholic people in your life or the people who might be lapsed Catholics. Um, think about your relationship with them. You know, are they friends? Are they family? And I would say try to be as thoughtful and intentional as you can be about being the light of Christ to them. Because whether you realize it or not, you are that, truly. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful calling that all of us have. Um, so try your best at that. And if you're not Catholic and you're watching this and it's something that you're uh, considering, um, I would recommend, and, and this, and it's funny, Mother Teresa said about prayer, she said, it's, it only takes a few minutes and yet it's one of the hardest things that mankind has to do. We struggle with it. The catechism actually refers to prayer as a battle. It's the battle of prayer. But if you can just, just 60 seconds, if you've never done it, just to sit down in silent prayer and ask God where it is he's leading you um, and begin that dialogue with him, um, I think you'll find that your life uh, will be changed in a really beautiful and dramatic way. Awesome. That's so good. Uh, well, thank you so much again for uh, just sharing your story of what uh, Christ has done. Um, I guess very last question, where can people find you online? Sure. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, my, uh, gosh, username, call sign. I don't know. I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> it's Nick the Catholic, N-I-C-K, the Catholic. Uh, feel free to follow me for my uh, little snippets of my own faith life and uh, for my own uh, musings and um, for occasional uh, theology, uh, theological uh, uh, thoughts and whatnot. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Nick, for sharing your story. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Megan.